Welcome to another overview of the book of Mark. We're going to focus on Mark chapter 10. There's a lot of good information and teachings in this portion of scripture. We start off with the Pharisees, which are the religious leaders, coming to trap Jesus again. There's huge crowds that are following Jesus, and these Pharisees are in that crowd, and their motive is not to receive from him, learn from him, but to disprove him. And they're always bringing them tough questions. And one of the questions of the day was divorce. They started talking about divorce. There was two schools of thought in divorce, and one of them was from a rabbi, and, and his school of thought, thought was that you could only get divorced under sexual immorality. And there was another school of thought when it talked about divorce was you could get married, I mean, divorced for just about anything. They even had some rules like this. If your wife burned the breakfast, you could divorce her. If your wife somehow talked to a strange man, you could divorce her. If you just found somebody that you thought was more fair, or more beautiful, you could divorce her. So there were some arguments about divorce. So they come to Jesus and they say, some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a, que with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, they said he permitted it. They replied, he said, a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this command only as a concession to your hard hearts. So Jesus went, goes ahead and he begins to teach on this a little bit. And he says, the reason Moses permitted divorce. Now understand this, divorce was not a command. It was permitted. So he didn't, nowhere in scripture does it say, if your wife does something I, that's, that, that is wrong or, or she does something that's unclean, you're commanded, divorce her. So he said the reason that Moses permitted divorce was one reason, hard hearts. And there's two sides of a hard heart when it comes to divorce. One is someone's involved in sin and they refuse to repent of it. Someone's being unfaithful and they're saying, I'm not going to break up with the person. I'm going to continue in my adultery. The other side of a hard heart is this. I refuse to forgive you for your sins. Either way, hard hearts cause divorce. Now, Jesus was saying, it was never my intention when I created marriage to have an escape clause. It was never my intention for there to be a divorce. When I created marriage, this was the goal, that they would leave their father and mother, be joined together, and live with each other, start a new family, and live with each other until death do they part. And that's why further on in the scripture, he says, what well, God has joined together, let no man separate. So their focus was on divorce, and Jesus was focusing on the definition of what marriage was originally meant to be. And I, I guess that's how we are today. We could focus on divorcing, escape clauses, or we could take all that energy and make our relationships work and enjoy a marriage the way it's supposed to be. So Jesus really addresses the issue and he focuses on, on the definition of marriage, not really focusing more on divorce. God wants marriages to stay together. Jesus, God created marriage, but not only did he create marriage, he defined it. Let's look at this real quick. This explains why a man, and this is in verse seven, this is why it explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. He defines it. Uh, today, we're, we're def trying to redefine marriage as a society, but Jesus uh, goes ahead and, <laughs> and re redefines it again, says it again, re reclaims, and he says, marriage is between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And this is what happens. They leave their father and their mother, and then they join and they create, join together, and they create a new family unit. That's what marriage is all about. And 
if we continue focusing on keeping our marriages together, this is what happens. The result will be we'll, have, we'll be able to raise godly children. And, and that's what really God wants after Saul said and done. Let's go into the second part of this chapter. And this, cha- this second part of this chapter, uh, th- there's some parents that are bringing their children to Jesus. And, I, and let's just stop there. It's the responsibility of parents to bring their children to Jesus. Bring them to church. We bring them to Jesus through a Bible study. We bring them through Jesus through exposing them to Christian music, praying with them, teaching them the word on a daily basis, living out a godly example. But it is the parents' responsibility to bring their children to Jesus. Now, the disciples got upset. And this is what they said to the parents. Stop bothering Jesus. Stop bringing these children to Jesus. And Jesus, this is what the Bible says, he got really angry. Think about that. That Jesus is angry because the disciples are doing all they can to stop the children coming to him. And then Jesus says, let, this is what he says, let the children come to me. This is verse 14. Don't stop them for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. And, and I think about this. That God, Jesus, is angry at anyone that's trying to stop children to come to him. It could be parents. He's angry at parents that don't bring their children to Jesus. He'd be angry at ministries that don't have a way for children, have a children's ministry that are focusing on the children. I look at a stat the um, the other day, and it said two-thirds of people that will ever give their lives to Jesus, have faith in Jesus, come to Jesus before they're 18 years old. Think about that. Children have faith, that they do have faith. I've never met an atheist child. To be an atheist, you have to be taught atheism. Children believe. All the responsibility of a parent is in our society and churches is to continue nurturing the faith they already have and bring them to Jesus. So Jesus is reminding us children's ministry is really important to me. And I want to bless the children, introduce them to me. And when we introduce our children to Jesus, you know what he does? He touches them. Let's bring our children in proximity so Jesus can touch them. I, I have five girls and, and I had, a, I knew that the, how I was introduced to Jesus was through my mother. She'd have Bible studies with me all the time. And she would get involved in children's ministry when I was a child. And, and she wasn't just looking at the church's responsibility. She was saying, I want to partner up with the church or the church is partner with me. And I'm going to do everything I can to bring my child at the closest proximity to Jesus' teachings and allow him to touch my son. I realized that was a great pattern. And what I did was I made sure intentionally I had Bible studies with my little girls. And I'd I'd come home from work at times, tired. And before they went to bed, we'd read a little Bible story. And that little Bible story, it it was just literally like this story. It's bringing my children to Jesus. And he touched them. I thank God all my five girls are serving God today. And they're, you know, they're all adults now. But that's how it happens. We bring our children to Jesus. Let's look at the next section. And now we're talking about a rich man. Uh, This story is a rich young ruler. He asked a question, really important question. He knelt down before Jesus and he asked, good teacher, this is verse 17, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This question seems like it's a really good question because it is, but there's two problems with this question. One is, he, he, he calls Jesus good. Now, Jesus immediately says, why do you call me good? Jesus asks, only God is truly good. Now, that's a very important, uh, important statement because no one will ever be saved because they were good enough. The truth is, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need to be saved. So Jesus was addressing the first problem with this question. You think I'm good? 
Well, you know there's only one that's truly good and truly righteous, and that's God. Are you saying I'm God? Or are you thinking that you're good? Are you just using that word lightly? I remember when me and Lisa, when we first got together, uh, uh, and this is like our first date. I was a little crazy and wild. And I told her, look, I want you to understand the word love means a lot to me. So I'm not just going to tell you I love you just straight off the top. I'll tell you I love you when I really mean it. And th- when I tell you I love you, that means I'm 100% all in. And I think this is what the rich man was using this word good really loosely. Good. You're good. And I'm good. We're all good. But the reality is he wasn't good. And he said, what must I do to inherit the king or, or inherit eternal life? That was the second problem with the question. What must I do? Now, for a rich man to say, what must I do, was probably something he was really familiar with because most people that are rich are successful doers. And they'll say this, I do, the reason I'm rich, I do this, I do that, I do that. And, that's, and it's most likely true. But the problem is their faith is in their doing and you cannot get saved when your faith is in your doing. And that's why for a rich man to get saved is difficult because he thinks the same way this prior rich man thought. I did this to earn my riches. What do I need to do to earn salvation? Because I don't want a free lunch. I don't believe in free lunches. I believe you have to earn your living. Now, with this type of mindset, you have to earn your living. It's easy to start thinking, I have to earn my salvation. But no one could ever be saved by doing. We're saved by what Jesus Christ has done. Our faith is in him. And that's why Jesus said, you have to come like a child. A child is dependent on God. A rich man is independent. I don't, maybe I think I don't need God. I'm self-sufficient. So Jesus is addressing these two things. And he needs to get this rich man to the place where he acknowledges he's a sinner in need of a savior. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. You know what that means is blessed are those that realize they need God. (laughs) That's the most important thing. He doesn't realize he needs God. So Jesus says, you know the commandments. And you know what he said? I do all of them. Rich man says, I do all of them. And then Jesus says, I'm going to show you where your sin's at right now. Are you ready? I love you. And the reason I'm going to tell you this is because I love you and I want to have a relationship with you. He goes, you lack one thing. Sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Now, when I read this, it was uniquely stood out to me that Jesus didn't tell him to get rid of all his money. He told him to sell all of his possessions, the things he bought with money. This is what happened to this rich young ruler. His identity became the things that he owned. That means he bought things. And and today would have been like, sell your Lamborghini, (laughs) sell your house on the beach, sell all the gold chains that you have, sell those things that are now your identity. Because as long as those things are your identity, you'll never be able to follow me because you're following possessions. Possessions are your identity. So he told him, sell. He remember, he didn't tell, he had, he probably had a lot of money. He didn't tell him to get rid of all your money because it wasn't a money problem. It was a heart issue. So Jesus was telling him, sell all your positions, p- possessions. But you know what the Bible says? He chose possessions over Jesus. That means he was not willing to repent of his sin. His sin was his pride. He didn't want to let it go. And, and, and it's impossible to serve God without first acknowledging we're sinners and repenting of our sins and then placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let's go on to the, another part of this, of this chapter. And another part of this chapter is where the disciples respond to the teaching on the riches and, and the rich man. And, and part of the last part of the teaching, Jesus says, for rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, it'd be easier for a camel to, to go through an eye of a needle. And, and, and then the disciple says, whoa, who can be saved then? Because they actually thought this, that a rich man is probably the most saved of all of us because He's so blessed by God. So they were thinking, well, who can actually be saved then? These guys are blessed because they're actually rich and you must have blessed them. 
And Jesus was just letting them know that the reason for rich man is difficult for them to be saved is that they become self-sufficient. And they depend on the riches and their money to satisfy the void that's in their hearts. Um, but it's a, it's a futile attempt. Also, the rich have this mindset that they live more for today. They're not thinking about eternity. Uh, and, and without thinking about eternity, uh, most likely you're not going to get there. This rich young ruler was thinking about, about eternal life, which was great. But these disciples were thinking, well, then who can be saved? If these guys are, I mean, they're doing, they're like, they're successful. They do things, it seems right. Um, they do things better than we do. And Jesus was making it clear, no one's going to be saved based on their own merit. But with God, all things are possible. How do we get saved? God saves us when we believe. That's about, of course, salvation is impossible. Eternal life is impossible. But there is one way to be saved, with God. With God, all things are possible. Place your faith in Jesus and you'll be saved. Jesus now goes into reminding his disciples in this next section of, um, of, of Mark chapter 10 that he's going to suffer and die. They're not thinking about suffering and dying. <laughs> They're thinking about the last teaching that he did about riches. And Jesus reminds them, and this is very important in verse 33. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. And Jesus is reminding them, understand, and not, not so long from right now, I'm going to be, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die for the sins of mankind. This is the only way we can be redeemed. The price for our sins must be paid. And what happened here in this moment that Jesus is prophesying, what's going to happen is the sins of the world, our sins, my sins, your sins, were placed on Jesus. And all the suffering and pain and punishment that he went through was him loving us so much that he paid the price for our sins. The good news is because of this prophecy, we can all be forgiven of our sins because our paid sins have been paid for and we can receive by faith alone. We can't earn it. We can receive eternal life. Jesus loves you. And no matter what you've done, the good news is the price has already been paid. He was prophesying what he was going to do. He already did it and he resurrected from the dead, conquered death. Isn't that great news now let's go into the last section and i want this is a story about a blind man that wants to gain his sight and his name is blind bartimaeus and in verse 47 says when bartimaeus heard that jesus of nazareth was nearby he began to shout jesus son of david have mercy on me what's interesting about this portion of scripture He's the first, one of the only few people that is named. He has a name, Blind Bartimaeus. We don't know why he was named here, but we do know this, that he was desperate for a miracle. Were there other blind people around? I am sure. Were there other sick people around? Were there people with leprosy maybe there? There was a lot of sick people. Were there people that were addicted and bound and depressed and full of anxiety and fear? I'm sure they were. But the one that received the miracle that day was the one that cried out for a miracle. And maybe today you're not receiving a miracle because all you're doing is talking about your condition, but you're not praying and crying out, Jesus, have mercy on me. I love the word mercy he uses because what he's saying is, he didn't say, Jesus, give me a miracle because I'm a good person. He didn't say that. He said, Jesus, have mercy on me. What he's saying is, I don't deserve it, but can you forgive me? Can you touch me? And can you heal me? Maybe he knew his condition. Maybe the rich man thought he was good. And blind, blind Bartimaeus knew he was a sinner. He was asking for mercy. Thank God that we serve a merciful God. You don't have to earn your salvation. You can't. You can't earn a healing. You can't. You can't earn a breakthrough, a touch of God. You can't. You receive it 
because of God's mercy and his grace. Isn't that good news that we serve a God that's saying, hey, you qualify right now. Just ask me. Bring your faith to me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled. <laughs> obstacles. There always seems to be obstacles when we begin to uh, seek after God. Be careful that you don't get offended by the people that are trying to get in your way. People will get in your way. Circumstances will get in your way. But don't let them be an excuse of you not getting your miracle. You not getting your breakthrough. Don't be one of those people that say, well, I started, I tried, I went to church, I ran into some really rude people. Don't use people as an excuse of you not following after Jesus and receiving everything that Jesus has for you. They yelled at him, but this is what happened. But, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. You know what he did? He didn't get, allow them to discourage people to discourage him. He actually shouted louder. What he was saying is, you think I'm loud now? Wait till you see this. I'm going to scream it at a higher level. I am here to get my sight. You guys seem like you're okay with your condition. I'm not. I'm getting my miracle. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, my rabbi, the man replied, I said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. Wow. After he shouted louder, Jesus heard him and he says, what's all this commotion? Who's calling out to me? Who's standing out of the crowd? Today could be your day. I don't know how many people are going to be watching this video. Are you going to be the one that's standing out of the crowd? That's just not watching it. But right now you have a desperate situation and you realize that I need some help. It's okay in your living room, in your car, wherever you're listening to this, to cry out and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Save my child. Heal me. Save me. Set me free. Give me eternal life. And this is what's happening. As soon as you say it, Jesus is saying, I hear you. What do you want? And then, and then Bartimaeus says, I want to see. See, Bartimaeus maybe had more than one problem, but he was focused. I want to see. And could it be we're not getting miracles because we're too general? We really don't care. Our, our prayers are like really generic. What is the thing that you're praying for and believing for? You can receive it today. The same Jesus that was here in this scripture loves you and wants to help you. So today we we went through Mark chapter 10. What a great chapter. It talked about divorce. It talked about children. Um, even in the portion of scripture I didn't mention, it talks about the disciples fighting for position. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And, and Jesus says, don't worry about that. The greatest is a servant. <laughs> Just start serving. That all figure itself out in heaven. Stop trying to be great and just focus on serving people. And I think that's what ministry is all about and life's all about is that we receive from the Lord mercy and grace and then we go ahead and live a life of giving that to others. Freely we receive, freely give. So if today you're saying, man, I need a miracle just like Bar blind Bartimaeus. Your name's on it. There's a miracle with your name on it. Why don't we go ahead and pray? And today, maybe you're like the rich man that has everything, but you don't have eternal life. He said, I need eternal life. There's only one way to get it. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Put your faith in Jesus. One of these days, your riches are going to be gone. You're going to leave them all behind. And the only thing that's going to matter is whether you place your faith in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus, I thank you. And I realize that I'm a sinner that needs a savior. I heard in this scripture, and I believe it, that you were betrayed, you, you suffered, you were beaten, you were buried, you were crucified for my sins, and then you resurrected on the third day, overcame and paid the full price for all my sins. Thank you for taking my place. Today, I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins, I place my faith in you. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord 
and Savior. And now I give you all of my concerns, my problems, just like a child that places their faith in, the fa faith in his father. I'm not going to be worried. I ask you to help me. I, I ask you, Lord, right now for a miracle. Touch my life today. I receive it by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. That's the overview of Mark chapter 10. Look forward to Mark chapter 11. God bless you. Love you guys. Have a great day. Um.